Anna, so she wants the link to your Zoom. She wants the link to my Zoom? Yeah. Um, so, um, I have some news for you that goes with a bit of an announcement and such about the way the rest of this school year is going to go. Do you want that at the start of class or at the end of class? I don't care. Oh, um, At the end. What's that? At the end? Yeah. Okay. So people Good. can I can hear with that. That's that's fine. Um, so before we start, is there any questions from yesterday's assignment that we need to go over? That you'd like to go over? No! I know you've got odd answers in the back, but is there any problems that you like to see worked out or um, explained before uh, we get into new stuff? 46. Okay. We're page 407. So it uh, looks like we have a drawing already on the on the page, right? Mm -hmm. So let me see if I can sketch this here. It's kind of it's kind of similar to the um, <coughs> the drawing I laid out for you with the um, the frisbee thing, which by the way is going to be my weekend task this weekend. Mm -hmm. So um, what I feel like might be challenging here is, whoops, is the angles. Is that where the issue might have come up? I just didn't, I didn't know where to start. <laughs> okay, well, did you, did you see the drawing there? Yeah. Okay. Oh, hey, you guys, thanks for coming. Um, and then this right here, is 63, right? Mm -hmm. And so the boat is traveling at a speed of 10 miles an hour. And then 15 minutes later, it's at the other spot. 15 minutes is a fourth of an hour. So I think I can put 2.5 miles right there. Does that help? Yeah, I thought that was just like irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a big deal. Um, now I find this kind of interesting though, because it's not really asking you to find the triangle. Did you all kind of pick up on that? This is 46, by the way. It's not really asking us to find the triangle. I feel like it's asking us for, um, we get a lot of colors going on here, but I think it's asking us for that distance. Am I reading that right or not? The lighthouse located at the shoreline, what's the distance from the boat? Oh, wait a minute, to the shoreline. Maybe it is asking for this, huh? I, it shows in the picture the... Oh, it is. It is D, right? Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. So it is asking for this distance right, right here. And by the way, the blue dash line is the same as that pink line, D, right there. So I guess the question here is, what do we need to find out? I mean, basically, if I have 70 degrees there, and I want this, I think I need one side of the triangle, which is probably this side right here. Does that work for you? That's the piece I need. And so I think I can use that to set up my law of sines problem. The 63 degrees is interesting. I know for sure that this is 20. Are you okay with that? Because it has to make 90 degrees to go perpendicular mm -hmm. to the shore. 
And I also think that this big angle here is 153. Can you explain why it's 153? Yeah. Do you get why it is, Foster? Yeah. Okay. Of, yeah. We have a 90, 90 degree angle and then plus 63. Mm -hmm. So I can call this X now. And I think I can set up um, X over sine 163 equals, hmm. 2.5 over, guys, this is almost exactly the, the, the tennis court problem, isn't it? It's like, this is my house and this is Tom's house, that's the tennis court. This really tiny angle down here is 153, 1.7 degrees. And by the way, that doesn't have anything to do with the fact that this is 20 degrees down here. I mean, that's 20 because 70 and 20 and 90 have to make 180, but that's not even relevant at all to our problem. So I think we can do this, can't we? Yeah. Let, me, let me do a quick calculation. This is gonna be 2.5 sine 163 divided by sine seven. And this comes out to be X is approximately six months. I get 5.9976. Now, Foster, if I know what this is, can I find D pretty reasonably from there? Yeah. Once again, I have 70 degrees and so on. So this mm -hmm. just becomes a right triangle problem, which is you kind of look back and like, wow, that seems really easy now to do a right triangle problem. It's been a while since we've done that. Yeah, that's, that's a fair question to ask about. And I hope that that makes a little bit more sense. It's unusual to have to use the law of signs to find a piece that we can then put in the, uh, the right triangle. Okay, anything else off the assignment from yesterday? Okay, should we get to more stuff? So again, those of you that joined us a few minutes um, after we started, uh, I've got some news and a bit of an announcement to make about how the rest of this year is going to go, but we decided we're going to talk about that at the end of the hour. And that means I'm changing your assignment a little bit for today, and I'll explain all that uh, when we get there. So, um, <clears throat> bottom line is a lot of science is great, and we love using it when we have all the right uh, information for a triangle specifically an angle side pair, and then some other value. But there are some situations where we don't have the information we need to use the law of sines. And so we have to use the law of cosines. So in that spirit, I have for you another field trip slash yard problem to watch here on the on the YouTube. That is just a minute long. And here we go. And I, I'll you can watch this again if you want. The, the links will be in there. But um, so just so just so we're clear, this is my house again. This is just right around the corner from where I was looking down the tennis court. I'm now looking just flat at my house. Um, hi there, everyone. I'm outside my house again. Um, and yeah, I haven't figured out how to flip the camera while I'm video, I'm recording video, so sorry. Um, the question I'm trying to figure out here is how far is it from the street or from the sidewalk to the back side of my property that overlooks this big hill? And I would measure it, but the problem is I got this house in the way. I don't know how to measure it. So I'm standing here um, at a point on my grass where I can see both the side of the flat property and the street side and I'm trying to figure out how I find this this basically this third side of this triangle if all I can do is measure this leg which I can easily do and measure this leg which I can easily do and I'm rotating through this angle right here so I have a side an angle 
at another side, and I'm trying to find that third side of the triangle, and that means we need the law of cosines. Okay, so indeed, oh good heavens, what's going on here? Indeed, we need the law of cosines. And what I want to do is show you what this scenario looks like from a triangle perspective. And then we'll start walking through some of the real interesting characteristics about the law of cosines. So let me sketch out for you what, what I have. I had a straight line there. I had another straight line here. I'm trying to solve for this third straight line there. Let me extend this just a little bit so it looks like that. Okay, got that so far? And now I'm going to add a couple of values to this problem so that you get a sense for the, the task ahead of me. I measured 47 feet from where I was standing here to the edge of the hill. And I measured 78 feet to the road. And I could also measure uh, this was 98 degrees. Okay, and then the question is, how do I find this third side? And of course, there's a house in the middle, so I can't I can't just put on a, a, a get out a measuring tape and measure it. So I want you to see this is not a case where we can apply the law of sines because we don't have a known side angle pair. Like I don't know what this angle or this angle is right there. And yeah, I could probably go out and measure. I get that, but that doesn't make the problem very fun for us. So we're gonna act like we can't measure it, and we have a dilemma. Now, <clears throat> I want to point a couple things out here. If this angle here had been 90 degrees, couldn't I do this? Wouldn't this be the Pythagorean theorem if I did, if I did 90 degrees? But it turns out that it's a little bit bigger than 90 degrees which in my mind makes me want to think that this leg here is a little bit bigger than the Pythagorean theorem would normally have given me. And then conversely, if, if for some reason I was doing a problem where this angle was smaller, you know, this angle here was smaller than 90 degrees, then this hypotenuse would probably be, uh, hypotenuse, this third side would be smaller and the hypotenuse would have been if it was a right triangle. So you shouldn't be terribly surprised to learn that the law of cosines, which allows us to tackle this problem, is very closely related, even closer than you probably realize, to the Pythagorean theorem. So I'm going to move on to a new page. We'll come back and solve this in just, just a second. I want to set up another problem, just kind of like we've done before, this sort of dummy triangle. I'll give you some time to sketch this as well. Um, I'm going to pull, call this A, B, and C. And this will be side A, side B, and side C. Okay? So this is all kind of a standard, nondescript, could be any kind of triangle, definitely not a right triangle, just a random kind of triangle. So I'm going to give you the first form of the law of cosines here. But there's a whole lot I want to talk about before we get into really applying this. The law of cosines says that c squared equals a squared plus b squared, comma, dot, 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 you're thinking, wait a minute, that looks a lot like Pythagorean theorem. Minus 2ab sine c. So immediately, I'd like you to appreciate that the Pythagorean theorem kind of lives inside of this law of cosines. 
And then there's this other term here, this minus two AB cosine C, which again uses the two sides and an angle. Now, this is an included angle. So notice that we have side, angle, side here. The law of cosines works when you have the SAS condition or two sides and the angle in between it, just like I have in this example right here, where I have my two sides and the angle in between. Okay, if I had another angle, then I would effectively have a law of sines situation. Does that make sense? If I have this angle here, then I have an angle side pair, and I can do all kinds of really interesting things with that. So this is the first version of the law of cosines, but it goes deeper than that. It doesn't just work for a squared, b squared, c squared. We can also write a squared equals b squared plus c squared plus 2 bc cosine a. Again, I can, uh, let's see if I can do this here. I can tackle this problem with these two sides and their included angle. And then going further, I can also write that b squared equals a squared plus c squared plus 2ac plus b. So just like we saw in the law of sines, A's, B's, and C's don't really mean anything here. There's nothing magical about A squared, B squared, C squared. It's just two sides and the angle included in between them. Okay? Now, I want to go back real quick to my problem that we'll tackle in just a second, but I want you to look at this real quickly. To me, this is the moment when the law of cosines really kind of becomes real to us. And I want you to look at what the law of cosines would give us if this angle here was 90 degrees. Quick review, what's the cosine of 90 degrees? Zero. One. It's zero. Oh, you're just going to be quiet, right, Anna? Yeah. You're just going to not say anything. Is that it's an implied zero there? Exactly. <laughs> Cosine of 90 is zero. So if I have a 90 degree angle in my problem, then this whole term here is zero, which means this whole term here is zero, which means what? No, do you understand what a big deal that is? You've been using the law of cosines since geometry, and you didn't know it. The Pythagorean theorem is the law of cosines, but it's just a special case. All your geometry teachers try to convince you that the Pythagorean theorem is the big deal. It's not the big deal. It's a special case of an even bigger deal. And that even bigger deal is the law of cosines. You don't get to go back and gripe to your um, geometry teacher that they ruined your life. But I want you to understand the Pythagorean theorem is nothing more than a special case of the law of cosines. So let's go one step further now. What does it look like if C this angle here, whoops, you see this angle here is bigger than 90. What's the cosine, let me, here's a circle here. What's the cosine of angles up in this region up here? Angles that are bigger than 90. I'm talking about what's, what's the SIGN, positive or negative, minus, plus or minus, what's the sine of cosines that are up in this area? Negative. Right. 
any angle bigger than 90 has a cosine that's negative. And by the way, even though we can calculate cosines of angles bigger than 90 degrees, we can't have that inside a triangle. Can you all go along with that? That in a triangle, you only get between zero and 180 degrees. That's all you get. So if I had an angle that's bigger than 90 degrees, its cosine is going to be negative. And when I subtract a negative, what do I end up doing? Adding. And so c squared ends up being bigger than just a squared plus b squared, which is what it would have been if this was a right triangle. But when c is bigger than 90 degrees, the cosine of c is negative, and when you subtract a negative, you end up adding. Are you guys flying? Okay, whatever. You end up adding, and c squared ends up being bigger, so then c ends up being bigger than the hypotenuse. But now, of course, what happens if we're over here? In this region, what's cosine in that quadrant? Positive. Positive. So it's very reasonable, guys, to have an angle that's less than 90 degrees. I mean, this one is, this one is, many angles and triangles are less than 90 degrees. So what happens to the third side? Well, I'm subtracting a positive number, which means c squared is going to be smaller than it would have been if this was a right triangle. So I don't want to get too nerdy here, but let me just show you this real quick. Look what would happen to um, this angle right here. Imagine if this angle was a right was a right angle. So I have this side here and this side here. Obviously, this is too small to be a right angle, right? But if you open this up, so it looked like this instead, so this was a right angle, I'll erase all this in a second, then wouldn't this green opposite side be way bigger than it is? If it has to connect the edges of those two sides, it have to be way bigger. So by shrinking it down, effectively by making this angle here smaller than 90 degrees, I have shrunk its opposite side which would be like a hypotenuse, but of course hypotenuses don't really mean anything in this setting. Let me clean this up just a little bit. My point here is Pythagorean theorem lives inside this uh, law of cosines, but uh, law of cosines is really cool, like really, really cool. So with that, um, I'm, I'm still going to hold off a little bit for, the, um, for my problem. I would like to give your books handy. I'd like you to look on page 411. I'll pull it up here as well. If you don't, I'll walk you through the, the problem. But page 411 um, has two application problems. I want to do the softball problem. It's the softball checkpoint question, um, about a third of the way down the page. So what we have here is um, a softball diamond. And if you aren't familiar with softball, all the bases are 60 feet. They're not 90 feet like baseball. And this problem says that the ball is hit to dead center field. That's right out here, exactly in center field, right there. So it's hit like this. And obviously this is not drawn to scale, but we get the idea. And it's 240 feet. So this is 240 feet, hit out to center field where the outfielder, it doesn't say the outfielder catches it, just throw the ball to third base. So the next part of this problem is gonna be, all right, we're gonna throw the ball to third base. And we want to know 
How far is that throw? If you're a fan of the Mariners, and this goes back a long, long time to before any of you were born, but when Ichiro was a rookie, he made a play on a ball in right field against the Oakland A's, considered one of the best throws in the history of baseball, and threw a guy out on a line at third base. It's one of his greatest plays, one of the greatest plays in the history of baseball. And they were able to calculate, you know, they figured out how far that throw is. So this is kind of a thing that outfielders like to do. So my question is, how do we figure out that um, length? Well, we first write down all the things that we know. We know that one leg of that triangle is 60 feet. And another leg of the triangle is 240 feet. And so we think, ah, if only I knew this angle here, I would have my SAS situation and I can use the law of cosines. So whether you're a baseball, softball player or not, what's that angle? 45. Exactly. Because it's every, every angle between the bases is 90 degrees and this is exactly cut now, so 45 degrees. So would you take just a second, play around with this and figure out what this, uh, how long that throw was? using law of cosines. And if you need it, I think that you can see the law of cosines almost anywhere on these pages. Uh, I wouldn't go to the bottom of page 411, but you go on the left-hand side as well, 410. Let's figure out how long this side is right there. And I'll do that as well on my paper so we can check ourselves. I'm going to ask for volunteering just a minute to walk us through what you did here. To walk us through the math, and I'll just sort of write down as we go rather than just saying check our answers. I want to know what, what the process would be. What does it mean? Lucas, do you have this? To the extent that you could walk us through it? Uh, kind of. OK. Let's, let's take a shot. I think everybody is getting close to it. Um, take, a, take a shot. Walk us through it. I'll write down what I hear, and we'll just sort of check and see how the work looks, OK? OK. So you have 60 squared plus 240 squared minus 2 times 60 times 240 times the sine of 45. Cosine? Cosine, yes. You get lucky because it's the same, right? And what does yes. that equal? 202.07. Uh, no, you're a couple steps ahead of me. So let's back up just for a second. 
I'd like you to get in the habit of saying like C squared equals that. Oh, C squared equals 40,835.3. Right. This, I think, is a really crucial step right there. Give yourself a chance to convince yourself of what C squared equals, and now C equals, what'd you say? 202. Point something feet. Yeah. Okay. Are there any questions about this process? If you did 240 and 60 first, I mean, like switch the order around, no problem. There's no rule that says which one has to be A, which one has to be B. You don't have to write C squared. You can call it whatever you want. But I want you to understand that whatever numbers you put here also have to be put there. And then this is going to be the cosine of the angle at the end. And I know this sounds silly to make a big deal about this, but that last step taking the square root is also very important. And it's easy to forget to do that. And you get this really large number. You're like, I don't understand why I'm so far off. It's because you've forgotten to take the square root. Any questions on this? Okay. I'd like you to go back now and help me solve this problem. How far is it from the street to the hill of my house? And you notice this is different because it's an obtuse angle. So I'll give you just a couple of minutes to try that one. what you're starting to see here is that even though the law of cosines is a little bit daunting to look at, it's really, that's a two-step problem, right? It can be a one-step problem if you do square root of everything to begin with, but basically it's a one-step problem to get C squared, then you take the square root. Did you get like 96 feet? Yes. Yeah, 96.5 feet. So this is actually something that people do. When they want to, for example, measure the distance uh, across a lake, for example, or some big canyon, there's a way that they can measure um, certain sides of a triangle without measuring the third side, and they calculate that third side. I'll say you good? Okay. You don't look like you've, you're full of joy and life today, so I'm worried that maybe you're sad about math, but... I don't want you to be sad. I'm not sad. Okay, don't be sad. Wait, what was the answer again? 96.5? Okay, yeah. Good? Yeah. All right, so uh, there's one other scenario that I want to show you here, and it's, it's not actually even related to law of cosines so much, just sort of in here, and it's an added on topic, but I, I think I want to show it to you because uh, A, it's kind of cool, B, it has a cool name, and it, C, it allows us to tackle a problem that we would otherwise um, not be able to tackle. So <clears throat> the pronunciation of this is a tricky one. I've actually done research to figure out what the proper way to pronounce this is, and it's usually just pronounced the way you think everybody would call it Heron's formula. But I find, I find that really boring. I can't imagine that somebody super cool like this who invented this formula would have a name like Heron. So I call it Heron's formula. So I picture this being some very exotic French mathematician from the 1700s. I don't know. I call him Heron. Okay. 
No, it was just some guy in a dumpster. Some guy in a dumpster just diving around. <laughs> you know what? I, I wouldn't put it past it being that exactly what it is. So here's what Perone's formula looks like. If you only have the three sides of a triangle, you can find the area of the triangle. Now remember, we did this with the law of sines, but we always had to have this angle or this angle or even this angle up here, okay? So what do you do if you only have the three sides? And I present this to you because this scenario is also going to be a law of cosines problem for us. And I will say this again, but there's a decent chance you might want to know how to do that part of it for your final exam, hypothetically, okay? Perron's formula looks like this. The area of any triangle is the square root of four things multiplied together. S, S minus A, S minus B, S minus C. Okay, great. What's S? S is called the semi perimeter. And this goes for not just any triangle. Semi perimeter is actually used when you find the area of like regular polygons, like hexagons or pentagons or something. It's used with the apothem, and I don't know if you ever covered that in geometry or not. Semi-perimeter is one half of the perimeter. That's it. So here's what I want to do. I want to show you how to use Heron's formula, our dumpster guy, with a random triangle that has numbers on it. And then I want to show you one application of law of cosines with that same triangle. And then we'll be done and we'll talk about what I have to talk to you about. So let me just make up some numbers here that are not very exciting. 9, 10, 11. I give you this triangle, I'm like, find the area of that one. And your thought should be, there's no possible way. There's no way I can find the height of that triangle which I have to find at some point, you would think, until you don't. So what do you do instead? Well, the first thing we do here is we find the semi perimeter, which is a half of nine plus 10 plus 11. I can do that all in my head by my lonesome. That equals 30. So the semi perimeter is half of 30 is 15. So now, my area is going to be the following. The square root of 15 times all three differences. You get that? The difference between 15 and 9 is 6. The difference between 15 and 10 is 5. The difference between 15 and 11 is 4. And so what does this do? I can do this all on my own too. Look at this one. 15 times four is 60. Six times five is 30. And no, they don't all work out this nicely. So we get the square root of 1800, which is, I don't know. 42 plus Okay, so that's, that's Heron's formula for finding the area of a triangle where you know all three sides. So now, last thing I wanna, I wanna share with you this, and I, I know this is getting a little bit longer than I expected, but this is kind of cool. My question to you, and this is important because hypothetically, if one wanted to know this for their final exam, this might be something they might want to know for their final exam, just in theory. How do you find that angle right there? Well, like, what if you wanted to check this area, and we said as long as I know this angle theta, I could use the law of sines to figure it out, you know, one half A, B, sine C. How do I find that angle? 
And I'm going to tell you right now, I find that angle using the law of cosines. So look back real quick, the law of cosines. Where do we have? Right here. Do you or can you agree with me that there is an angle in this law of cosines? Any version you want. Agreed? There is an angle in there. So I'm going to go through this, and I'm, let, me, let me just sketch this, this one more time. This, this, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm overdoing the angles here, but I don't, I don't really care. 9, 10, 11. If I want to know this angle theta, then I've got to decide which letter I'm going to associate with that. I'm going to call that letter C. So this is side C. This can be A, this can be B. I don't really care which one's A, which one's B, but I have to know that that 10 is opposite theta. Why? Because now when I write C squared equals A squared plus B squared plus 2AB cosine C, I'm going to solve for that right there. That's going to be the cosine of my angle theta. And to be clear, do you remember the ambiguous case we dealt with where you get this one cosine, you're like, I don't know if it's the acute angle or if it's the obtuse angle because it's symmetric about pi over two? That doesn't happen with cosine because if the angle is acute, cosine is going to be positive. If the angle is obtuse, it's going to be negative. So whatever the sine, S-I-G-N, of cosine is here, they'll tell us what we're going to do. Watch. C squared is 100. A squared, 81. B squared, 121. Now, right now, I can tell you that, cos that this angle C is acute. Why? Because when I eventually subtract these from the left-hand side, I'll get a negative number. And this is also negative. Watch. Minus 2 times 9 times 11 cosine C. This, guys, is the process we use to solve for a missing angle in a triangle that has no angles. Once I have one angle, I use the law of sines to find the second angle, and then I use the 180 degrees to find the third angle. So watch. These two together make 202, right? I'm going to subtract 202, subtract 202, I get minus 102 equals minus 11 times 9 is 99, multiplied by 2, that's minus 198, cosine C. Now I divide. And do you see now how cosine is positive? I don't know what it is. 102 divided by 198 is 0.515. Not done. Inverse cosine of that. And angle C is 58.99 degrees, or about. So the law of cosines is a really nice tool for finding the missing angle. And I, we won't do it today, but if you really, really love doing this, you can let this be 59 degrees. You can imagine what this vertical line would be, and you could try using the formula using sine to find the area of this triangle, and you'd find that it comes out to be 42. Ha, huh, that's something, huh? All right, let me, um, let me give you a new assignment. This is not maybe what you saw posted. This is a new assignment. I'll explain why in just a second. This is going to be 6.2a. It's page 413, um, 8 through 24, multiples of 4, 37 to 49 odd. 53 and 54. 
Gonna put little stars by this. Because again, hypothetically, if this was something that you wanted to know for your final exam, those problems would probably be pretty good examples of the things you might theoretically want to know how to do for your final exam. Okay, so you do multiples of four, just a couple of problems at the beginning, then some um, odd problems and those two at the very end. Okay? All right. Um, I want to switch back real quick and talk you through the rest of this year for a second um, and help you understand a couple of things that have changed in the last few days. Early this week, the state OSPI, Superintendent of Public Instruction, sent out a notice that explained the way grading has to take place for fourth quarter. I'm not going to get into it in great detail right now. Mr. Goodnight's going to send a letter out uh, next week. But the long and short of it is, it's going to be just like it was for third quarter. And that is that your grades can be no lower than what they were when we left school for the entire semester. Which means our whole plan of doing third quarter separate from fourth quarter is gone now. Gone. Right. Yeah, I, I, I feel you, Lucas. So nothing you do the rest of the year can hurt your high school grade, whatever it was the day we left school in March. You can help yourself. You can certainly raise your grade, but you cannot lower your grade. If you decide you want to drop out of school right now and not do anything the rest of the way, you'll get an incomplete. And then you come back next year on our half days and you get to stay after for the half days and finish up that incomplete. But as long as you stay active, which of course you're going to, as long as you stay active, keep doing things, uh, nothing bad counts, only good things count. So to that end, I've made a couple decisions and these are kind of important. So I'm gonna take a few minutes to walk through this. First decision is I just decided I've given you all credit for all homework the rest of the year. So you don't have to turn anything into me. This is kind of like a college course now. Well, yeah, hey, hello. If you don't want to do homework, you don't have to do homework. I get, you just got credit for it. it. I think you're going to still want to do it. But if you don't, it's your world. Okay? Um, tests are still going to count. Um, but any bad tests will only count towards your college grade not towards your high school grade. Does that make sense? I hope so. Um, but also to that end, I started realizing that, frankly, in a lot of classes, some of the stuff we're doing just isn't gonna matter. You can't, it's not gonna hurt you at all. There's nothing to go down for. So I've changed our entire schedule around. And I wanna show you on the screen, which I hope you can see here, what this schedule is gonna be. I was going to spread out and cover things in more detail. I was gonna cover additional material and get us right up to the end to take our final. Uh, we're not doing that now. So we're gonna cover less material than we were going to, which means I'm gonna drop two questions off your final exam. And that's with permission of Central. Central sent us a list of, of topics that we could drop. One of them, uh, we're doing right now. One of them we're going to do next week. And the third one we would have done the last about week or so of the course. Uh, and that's polar coordinates, polar graphs, and so on. The, I looked through the final. That's, there's two questions of 13 that are on the final about that. And I'm just going to drop it from your test. So your, your final one, I have 11 questions, not 13 questions. We're not going to cover polar graphs, polar coordinates. It's, it's fine, whatever. So to that end, I'm also going to adjust our schedule for the week, where basically you're not going to have any class on Friday ever the rest of this school year, other than maybe your final exam. So let me go back to this month. I'm sorry, this calendar is kind of weird. This is April. This is today right here. So we're doing the Law of Cosines. I had planned to spend three days in the Law of Cosines. 
we're now going to spend two. So today, that's why I've changed the assignment around. Monday, you'll have an assignment. It'll be a worksheet. It'll be on the website. It's just a, some practice problems, the law of cosines. That's it. Tuesday, we'll have class. We'll start with vectors. Wednesday will be a review assignment. Thursday, we'll have class again. And we're just going to spend one day on vector operations. So next week, you've got just four days of assignments. But if you want to put your calendars together, April 28th, April 30th will be our lesson days. We only have four lessons left live this, this whole school year now. Four class periods left after today. So next Tuesday, Thursday, got that? And I'll, I'll leave this up long enough. You can take a picture if you want. I'll, I'll send you this, but I'll, I'll be updating this. For May, this is May. Um, oh, I take it back. We have five. Fun. We'll have class on Monday, May 4th. Monday, May 6th, and then I'm actually going to separate section six into two days because it's a little bit hefty. But uh, so section five will be two days, one day of teaching, one day of review. This will be two separate days of teaching, and then we are done on May 7th. Got it? What I'm going to do instead now is starting on May 11th. I will post, and this is a little bit unusual, but I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to post a, a, a past final exam for you to work on, a past central final exam. And I'll tell you which questions on that year's exam you don't have to worry about. I don't know which numbers they'll be, but I'll tell you which ones they are. And we will, I, like, I don't need to meet with you the entire week. What I'm going to do is hold office hours at 11.30, each of those three days, 12, 13, 14, if you want to show up. Not required, not anything. I'll post answer. I'm not sure if I can post answers. I might have to just give you answers. Maybe I'll email you answers. But I'll do that. And then what we'll do is like Monday or Tuesday will be like over questions one through three. Just anybody want to go over questions one through three, we'll do it. Wednesday, four, five, and six. And then Thursday, seven, eight, nine, or whatever the numbers are. And I'll post that that week. If you don't want to show up, you don't have to show up. No harm done, nothing. This is just, I have nothing planned. You just ask questions if you want to go over stuff. On the 18th, I'll post a second past final exam. And we'll do the same thing. Office hours, office hours, office hours. And then on the 26th, I'll just be here if you want to talk over anything. I don't have anything nothing planned for you and then we'll plan the final exam 27 28 29 one hour each day now keep in mind you're only going to have 11 questions instead of 13 questions so i'll decide there'll be about four questions a day and we i've been told to we you should all be taking the test at about the same time so at some point we need to figure out what a good time would be and i'll give you a little like i'll probably give you like a two hour window uh, where i like you to take the test and then I'll have some sort of um, like proctor form. It says, I, Anna Williams, took part one of the test between this time and this time. And this is the person who proctored me. And your mom will sign it and you sign it and that's it. And you'll include that with that portion that you sent in to me for that day. And then do something again for part two and part three. And we will be done still on May 29th. Are there any questions about that? So the days that I want you to be aware of are next week, Tuesday, Thursday, and the following week, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and that's it. Everything else, I'll advertise office hours times. This is just like college. Like I'll just be here. If you want to come in and chat, you can. If not, I'll stick around for 15, 20 minutes if nobody shows. No hard feelings. I'll just go on about my day and that'll be fine. I'll try to get you solutions so that you can at least check your answers. If you want to go over anything, I'll be very clear about, you know, on Tuesday we're doing these questions, on Wednesday we're doing these questions. I'll include that when I send that stuff out on Monday on the website. Okay? Is there anything that isn't clear or not with grading? I mean, this has all changed in the last 36 hours. So I'm now having to go redo 
everything. I wrote this last night. Um, I've got to kind of rethink. I'll show you this. This is my wall of everybody's calendar for the spring. Then in about a half an hour, I'm just going to crumple up and throw into in the garbage because it's, it's old news now. So that's kind of been the way of life. Um, but we'll have a new calendar, new everything, new lease on life starting, starting Monday. And no more classes on Friday, no assignments Friday, no nothing, no homework to turn in. We'll go over homework if you have questions, but nothing but another, um, well, let me ask you, do you want, an, do you want a midterm on this or not? Um, I'll tell you what I'll do. Let me think about this. Maybe I'll put together an optional midterm. You can take it if you want. If it raises your grade, great. If not, it doesn't. Would that be a positive thing or not? You, you tell me. Will it affect our college grade? Um, in a positive way, yes. Not in a negative way. So this is a way to boost potentially your high school and college grade. I, I don't want to give you a test just for the sake of giving you a test. If you want one, I'll make one. Maybe, maybe think about it. We'll talk about it next week, okay? Now I need to go back and redo some of the grades for fourth quarter because I, I have to now throw some of those out that maybe some of the lower quiz grades. So I'll rework on that today. But anyway, that's enough for today. That's a lot. We'll make this work. I'll see you on uh, Tuesday. Wait, yeah? can you show the assignment first? I didn't get it copied down. Assignment for today? Yeah. Yeah.